All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here tonight uh, at the uh, next chapter of our Illumination series for 2019. Um, tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Brother Gerald Smith, who is a retired uh, litigation attorney and an active member of three Blue Lodges, South Pasadena 290, Culver City Faux Shea 467, and Anchor Bell 868. He is a life member of two Scottish Rite Valleys, Pasadena, uh, California, and uh, Guthrie, Oklahoma. A longtime meditator, Gerald is a member of the Academy of Reflection, a school of Masonic meditation in Guthrie, Oklahoma, and is a part of a group that is working to establish an AOR chapter in his home valley in Pasadena. A master counselor of his chapter of the Order of Demolay, he received the Cavalier degree in 1964. Jerry has served since 2006 on the board of directors of a nonprofit child care resource center, CCRC, that administers $300 million per year in public support of early childhood care and education, and also operates four dozen Head Start centers in the San Fernando and Antelope Valleys. He has long served as CCRC's board secretary and serves as its board chairman this year. Jerry previously served with a number of esoteric meditation groups, including uh, Meditation Mount in Ojai, California, where he was also the board secretary before and after serving as its board president in 2000 through 2002. In that capacity, he has studied, practiced, and taught meditation for over 40 years and has often led meditations and given many talks on a wide variety of esoteric and other related topics. Jeriel is a frequent speaker at Blue Lodges throughout Southern California on Masonic topics, including Masonic meditation, the Knights Templar, Abraham Lincoln, um, and observant Freemasonry. He is presently serving his fourth term as master of the Southern California Research Lodge, also known as SCRL, and also is on the editorial board of SCRL's Fraternal Review a monthly scholarly journal of Masonic education and that received the California Grand Lodge's 2017 Communication Award for the best medium-sized Masonic Lodge publication. It is in those capacities that he is here to speak with us today on the topic of Freemasonry and the Tarot. Let's give a warm welcome to Brother Jerry. Well, welcome everybody. And um, for those of you, and I can't see who anybody is here because the light is, you guys are all back there in shadow. Um, this is a kind of a new uh, experience for me. Um, I usually either have a, a talk that's completely written out or I speak uh, uh, just uh, spontaneously on some topic that I really understand and like to get into exchanges with the audience. This is going to be more of a, of a fact-based talk about the relationship between Freemasonry and the Tarot. Um, it's also an experiment for me uh, to uh, try to put into action something that as the master of the research lodge, and this is an example, this is the September issue of the Fraternal Review magazine, which is about um, the tarot and its relationship to Freemasonry. And I've long maintained that one of the uh, uses of the Fraternal Review magazine, and let me give you, there's a, there's a bigger picture of it. Um, one of the uses of the magazine is that um, if, you, if you want to do Masonic education in your lodge, you can take an issue and we'll have a short, a medium, and a long uh, presentation. And that if you want to become a Masonic speaker, you can take any of these and do what I've done in this case, which is to kind of reverse engineer uh, the magazine. Um, one of the downsides of that I've, I've discovered, this is the second time I've given this talk, is that um, the magazine isn't presented in the kind of sequential uh, 
th thing that a talk is. So you can't give it in that same order. Also, people that talk on the same subject overlap each other quite a few times. So you may find me repeating myself a bit. And um, some of what I'm saying is, is my own words that I've composed, other parts of it, and I'm not going to be able to, to credit the individuals in the magazine. Everybody who, who contributes, everybody that we excerpt from, a lot of them is from longer pieces, um, we have a, a reference section at the end so you could trace back to the source and, and read the whole thing. But with that in mind, I'm going to um, start with a um, part of the, the inside cover of the magazine every month is, uh, is an introduction, either by myself as the master or one of the two major editors. And in this one, I, I wrote it. And I say that uh, we're now turning our attention to the relationship between Freemasonry and the Tarot. The primary relationship is that each is a comprehensive system of esoteric knowledge, of gnosis, emerging from the manifold streams known as the ancient wisdom that stretches back into the dim recesses of human history. I prefer the term the ageless wisdom as it started before the advent of written history and continues to be reiterated into the present day and will continue so into our as yet untold future. Freemasonry and tarot share the salient feature of conveying wisdom through symbols and imagery. This feature protects the deepest spiritual meanings from being comprehended by those of unworthy motive. And symbolism bestows an intentional ambiguity and universality that allows true seekers from any background or tradition to access their own esoteric truths by such contemplative practices as reflection, meditation, and prayer. Importantly, the true seeker should understand that the nature of these truths is that of understanding rather than belief, gnosis rather than faith. Moreover, it is more important to put the insights gained into one's practices of living a normal life, a moral life, normal should be a moral life, a moral life, than it is to have an intellectual understanding of the teaching, no matter how good the teaching is. Freemasonry is an intrinsically initiatory order, like many of the ancient wisdom schools. But whereas those ancient schools tended to have higher and lower inner and outer initiation ceremonies, we Masons all take the same three craft degrees. But due to differing individual interests, some of us do not take our initiatory experiences to esoteric depths through further study and contemplative practices. By contrast, Tarot is not specifically initiatory, but as you will hear, the Golden Dawn is an initiatory order and the tarot is involved in their initiatory, initiatory processes. As you'll hear, all three of its founders were Masons, as were many other Golden Dawn members then and now. For example, William Butler Yeats, Alistair Clare, uh, Crowley, in our time, in our place, Merrick Hamer, Eliphas Levy, a uh, Mason himself, but only briefly, was the first to relate Kabbalah especially the Tree of Life, to the Tarot. The relationships between Tabala, Kabbalah and the Tarot and uh, the Golden Dawn and Freemasonry are, are very um, significant and um, is a lot of what you're going to be hearing about. Um, we always start with a, uh, a little cover story in, in our magazine. And the main thing, point that's raised uh, on, on this point is um, 
as you can see, that's the illustration. That's a page from the from the book or from the magazine. The four letters involved in the tarot, written in a circle, may be interpreted as Rota, Torah, Orta, Tarot, which translates to the wheel of the law speaks by and through the tarot. Every issue we, we feature a Masonic pioneer, and in this one, um, we recognize uh, Arthur Edward Waite. He usually writes under the name A.E. Waite. And he lived from 1857 to 1942, was a Freemason, a cultist, mystic, and author. He's best known as the developer of the most po popular tarot deck. You see the picture of it in the corner there. Um, the Rider Weight deck. Rider was the publisher, and uh, Weight was the designer. As his biography, a biographer R.A. Gilbert described him, Waite's name has survived because he was the first to attempt a systematic study of the history of Western occultism, viewed as a spiritual tradition rather than aspects of proto-science or as the pathology of religion. In his book, The Book of Ceremonial Magic, Waite describes the Kabbalah and ceremonial magic. Ceremonial magic uses symbols to convey ideas and stories. He says symbolism is treated either as a barren mystification, a collection of supremely absurd treatises in which obscure nonsense is enunciated with preternatural solemnity, or it is regarded as a body of theosophy written chiefly in the form of symbolism. The Kabbalah is a storehouse of symbolism, the inner sense of which is or may be of importance. In his book, The Pictorial Key to the Tarot, Waite states that tarot embodies symbolical representations of universal ideas. I lost my spot here for a second. Yes, behind which lie all the implicits of the human mind. And it is in this sense that they contain secret doctrine, which is the re realization by the few of truths embedded in the consciousness of all, though they have not passed into express recognition of ordinary men. The pictures, icons, and symbols of the tarot present deal, ideals and truths universal to man, regardless of culture. Joseph Campbell presents this view in his Hero of a Thousand Faces, where he discusses his theory of the mythological structure of the journeys of the archetypal hero found in world myths. Let me find a good spot here. Earlier tarot writers, such as Jean-Baptiste Alliet um, and S.L. Mathers, both Freemasons, were believed to have heavily influenced Waite's tarot interpretation and in the images uh, and illustrations he used. Um, tarot scholar and researcher R.V. O'Neill reports in an article by, in the Occult Review that Waite stated that he and Pamela Coleman Smith designed the deck. We had the help from one who was deeply versed in the subject, O'Neill further states, that Roger Parisius suggested that this help came from William Butler Yeats. William Butler, Le William Butler Yeats, the famous Irish poet, was a member of the Golden Dawn, an organization with which Waite was prominently associated. Waite was also involved in with Gerard Ancelet, Vincent Incasse, known as Papus, who asserted Egyptian origins for the tarot. We'll hear more about that in a few moments. 
uh, Papus was a key member of the Gnostic Martinus order, and Waite incidentally wrote the preface to Papus's Tarot of the Bohemians. Thus, Arthur Edward Waite provides the most modern and authoritative interpretation of the major arcana of the tarot by a well-known Freemason whose sources are incorporated into his own work and who are thereby and who thereby provides a continuum of the tradition of tarot dating back more than a hundred years. In spite of the fact that tarot decks have recently been produced with the purposeful and sometimes superficial addition of Masonic themes and symbols, i.e. the Masonic tarot, the square and compasses tarot, etc., there is no historical precedent for any such deck. Manley Palmer Hall, pictured here, who most people that are interested uh, in, in Freemasonry are very familiar with. You know, he wrote the secret teachings of all ages about uh, hermetic, Kabbalistic, uh, and Masonic uh, mythology and, and philosophy. He has a uh, statement quoted on the, on the screen that, uh, the 10 globes and 22 channels of the Sephiroth, the tree of life, are analogous to the 32 degrees of Freemasonry. Um, he also has a chapter on tarot uh, where he uh, explicates the thing called, uh, from 1485, the Montagna uh, tarot deck, examples of which are, are pictured on the screen. Um, this is among the early known decks which have come down to us intact. This one from Italy. It's ascribed to Botticelli and Baldini. The complete set of 50 cards, sometimes referred to as tarots, were originally engraved on thin paper in 1485, apparently as instructive series as they could not be shuffled or dealt. However, the Kabbalistic significance is of the cards is apparent. That, and that is from a, a book titled The Tarot by Manly P. Hall. In his book, The Tarot, Brother Hall lists each of these 50 cards and provides small images of all of them. And the image here were found um, by Googling Montagna, the tarot deck. And most of them are available online courtesy of the British Museum. Uh, of particular interest to Masons are one of the seven cards for the liberal arts and sciences, rhetoric, one for the virtues, fortitude, and one of an artisan with his working tools, which is the larger illustration on the right-hand side. Next, we look at the Tarot of Marseille which was the first known standard pattern for tarot cards. They were invented in Italy and introduced into in France in 1499. It became a model for many of the later decks. This, these right here are, are examples shown from a deck published in 1760. In the um, early tarot, and some of the even modern decks, it's only what are called the major arcana that are fully illustrated. And the um, number cards and court cards, maybe I should have laid this foundation for those of you who are not familiar with a tarot deck. Um, it has the same 52 cards as in a deck of playing cards with four added because the, the court cards are uh, the page, the knight, which would be correspondent to the jack, the queen, and the king. And then there are 10 number cards, ace through, through 10. And then that is, those are called the lower arcana. And then there are 22 trump cards from the number zero 
to 21, or the number one through 21 with a zero added. The, the fool is the, the zero card, and you'll hear more about that in a few moments. Um, I mentioned in the introduction the golden dawn. Pictured here are the three um, <clears throat> founders of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And um, you, you will see from left to right uh, William Robert Woodman, uh, Samuel Liddell Mathers, and William Wynne Westcott. You'll see them each um, clothed in uh, regalia from one or another of the several uh, esoteric organizations they belong to, uh, Rosicrucians, Masons, um, uh, 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 quite a few um, different uh, but related. And the reason that we're particularly emphasizing them is that um, so many of their members, not just these three uh, founders, uh, Westcott, Woodman, and Mathers, but other prominent members who were Masons included Arthur Edward Waite, Paul Foster Case, Anthony Conan Doyle of uh, Sherlock Holmes fame, William Butler Yeats, and Alistair Crowley. Many of those also have had um, uh, major influences on the development of uh, tarot. For example, um, the tarot and the Kabbalistic, Kabbalist Tree of Life were essential part of the Golden Dawn's rituals. Uh, S.L. McGregor Burns, uh, McGregor Mathers, um, created the first Golden Dawn tarot deck. There are several modern decks that claim to be Golden Dawn Tarot. The best modern Golden Dawn Tarot deck was created by Robert Wang. You'll hear about his. In fact, it's spelled Wang, but I believe that it's actually pronounced Wang. And um, he is not, as the name would imply, um, of Asian descent. I think he was adopted by an uh, Asian parent. and. Um, Golden Dawn member Israel Regardi, who was very instrumental in um, that, that tarot deck. Um, examples of uh, Wang's uh, Golden Dawn tarot cards are these. Um, these are all uh, trump cards, which is another name for, for the upper arcana. And um, I take that back. These are all court cards. So you have left to right the King of Cups, the Prince of Cups, the King of Wands, and the Prince of Wands. And um, each of the, one of the features of the Golden Dawn Tarot is that uh, each of the cards um, has a specific name which gives a hint to what the, uh, the esoteric meaning is of the card. Um, here's another set. After leaving the Golden Dawn, Alistair Crowley founded Ordo Templi Orientis, the Order of the Temple of the East, and designed the Thoth Tarot deck painted by Lady Frida Harris Below are the fool, the magus, the magician that is, and the priestess from, from that deck. Um, the, these are our major arcana cards. The fool, who's got a zero uh, number, is um, symbolic of the individual who is on a, a, a spiritual journey to, to learn the, the, the truths that uh, esoteric societies um, hold. Um, the magician is the, is the first card. And um, all of these date back into um, Hermeticism. And you'll always see the um, magician in any of these decks. Um, in a posture like this, with one hand up, the left hand up, the right hand down, and 
that stands for the most basic of the hermetic principles, as above, so below. Um, this next card, this is from the Rider Waite deck. Um, and I'm calling it here the Rider Waite Smith deck because Smith uh, was the artist and uh, Waite was the, the designer. Um, this is the most popular of uh, all of the uh, cards. And as you can see, Masonic symbols really abound in, in this card in particular, but throughout the deck. Uh, you'll see with the High Priestess, so many Masonic symbols, but the ones that really leap out of you, if you're Masons, are those two pillars, B and J, Boaz and Jachin, and the uh, person who is familiar with the lectures on those and the Masonic degrees will notice the, uh, the lily works and the pomegranates and so on that all have Masonic symbolism. Um, the the weight deck in particular is is really filled with uh, with that Masonic symbolism. Um, I'm going to say a couple of words about this out of one of the articles in the in the magazine. Weight's tarot deck incorporates Masonic and Kabbalistic inner imagery. In the card illustrated here, the high priestess holds the Torah or the five books of Moses in her hands. The Torah represents the greater law. She sits between two pillars labeled J and B, the pillars of King Solomon's temple. The temple is embroidered with palms and pomegranates. She represents the supernal mother, the Shekinah, Mystically speaking, the Shekinah is the spiritual bride of the just man, and when he reads the law, she gives the divine meaning. And now here is one of the outstanding men with regard to the, uh, the con not only the development of tarot, but the way that it connects um, to the Golden Dawn and to um, the uh, other the other groups that that we've mentioned here. Um, in this slide, we point out that um, uh, his idea was that the. Um, Tarot, and you'll hear a couple, a little more detail on this in a minute, was rescued from the burning of the library of Alexandria. He believed that tarot was from two Egyptian words, tar meaning road and ro meaning royal, and together the royal, the royal road. And The beginning of the Tarot's esoteric roots can be traced to a prominent Freemason. Although playing cards were introduced into Europe in the early 14th century, the first Tarot deck is believed to have been created sometime between 1411 and 1425 by adding the 22 trump cards to those of a standard playing card deck. These cards were spread throughout Europe by gypsies who used them for divination and fortune telling. The tarot did not become associated with esotericism until three, three centuries later when a Swiss Protestant pastor, Antoine Court, who had renamed himself Antoine Court de Gabaline, I'm hoping I'm getting somewhere near the French. It's G-E-B-E-L-I-N. He became the first individual to see the tarot as a repository of ancient wisdom. Having been made a mason in 1771 in the Lodge Les Amis Réunion in France, I think that means the Lodge of the Friends United, he later joined a Lodge Les Neuf Sures where during the American Revolution, he was joined by Benjamin Franklin as a law brother. Beginning in 1773, he had been publishing his magnum opus, usually just called Le Monde Primitif, 
but and I'm not going to try the whole thing with uh, the French, but it translates to the primeval world analyzed and compared to the modern world. This is published in a serial form to a distinguished list of subscribers headed by Louis XVI of France. Volume 8 of this encyclopedic series that was published in 1781 contained a single chapter on tarot, wherein he related upon first seeing the tarot deck, he had an intuitive perception that it contained the secret teachings of the ancient Egyptians. Without the bit of uh, the benefit of Campion's later deciphering of the Egyptian language, and utterly without historic evidence, he created a history of tarot in which Egyptian priests had distilled the ancient Book of Thoth into the images of the 22 cards of the tarot's major arcana. He surmised that they were later brought to Rome, where they were secretly known to the Catholic popes, who brought them to Avignon, France in the 14th century, during the time of the schism wherein there were papacies but both Rome and in Avignon. Also included in the in uh, Court de Gablin's Monde, Monde, which means world, and Primitif, which means primitive, was an essay by the Comte de Malay, who made a further mystical connection of the 22 card uh, trumps of the tarot and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Another essay appended to this made the suggestion for cardomancy, that is card reading, after which a famous fortune teller known as Atelia published a technique for reading the tarot and thus the practice of tarot reading was born. Speaking of connecting the tarot to Kabbalah, uh, a gentleman named Alphonse Louis Constant, who renamed himself Eliphas Levy, was the leading esotericist of the 19th century. He was the first to directly associate the tarot with the Kabbalah, a body of knowledge passed mouth to ear when the student was ready to receive it. He associated the major arcana to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The tree of life has become a key element in the Kabbalistic interpretation of the meaning of tarot cards. This is the tarot, this is the tree of life in, the, uh, in one of its simplest forms. You see that Kabbalistic, the ten sephiroths, those are the, the circles, who you'll note are in three columns. You'll hear more about that in a few minutes. Are associated with the numbered cards of the mi minor arcana, the aces through the tens. And um, so th those ten each stand for some principle and um, the, the aces through the tens are interpreted when they show up in a tarot spread uh, in light of which one of those uh, Kabbalah seraphs, uh, sephiroths that is, um, are, uh, are uh, interpreted to have meaning. And then each of the pathways connecting them is associated with one of the cards of the major arcana. The passage from the first Sephiroth, Kether, to the tenth, Malkuth, is likened to a journey of the human soul represented by the fool to self-revelation, realization. This may be, this journey I see a parallel uh, with the symbolism of the Ashlers in, in masonry, the lifelong journey of making spiritual progress toward a, a, an, a, an ideal. Um, Elvis Levy, as I said before, is, was born Alphonse Louis Constant in 1810. He lived till 1875. He wrote several books connecting the tarot to both Masonry and the Kabbalah, the, Jewish, the Book of Jewish Mysticism. He was a Freemason, a renowned French occultist, 
and author whose works greatly influenced the growing number of esoteric and magical orders of the 19th century. In many of Levy's books, including Transcendental Magic and The Magic Ritual of the Sanctum Regnum, Levy associated the tarot with the Jewish Kabbalah and the Tetragrammaton, uh, from the Greek meaning consistent of four words, the uh, Hebrew name of God. It's a body of knowledge that it passed orally only when a student is deemed to be ready to receive it. Levy compared the major arcana to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Wouldn't you know it? You're supposed to start these talks by telling everybody to do what I just did. So uh, if you haven't already, I've, I've taken a hit for you. Uh, <laughs> the tree of life consists of 10 spheres, referred to as sephirot, which are connected by 22 different paths, expressing different interactions between the sephirot. The sephirots are named kingdom, foundation, victory, splendor. These are all uh, translated into English, of course. Um, beauty, mercy, severity, wisdom, understanding, and crown. That's going from the bottom up. And the paths of the tree of life correspond to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The sephirot, it should be noted, are divided into three pillars. The three sephirot on the right-hand side comprise the pillar of severity, in the center is the pillar of equilibrium, and the left is known as the pillar of mercy. They allude to the qualities of God. The rigor of the right-hand pillar is modified by the benign left-hand one, so that divine justice is always tempered by divine mercy. C.W. King, in his book, The Gnostics and Their Remains, explains the right pillar stands for the pillar of Jachin, and the left pillar stands for the pillar of Boaz. These pillars are labeled J and B on the high priestess card that we saw a few moments ago. And if you're at all a student of Masonic principles, you know that um, this pavement that I'm sitting on, the black and white pavement, is a very basic uh, feature of the ideal Masonic Lodge, and it represents the opposites in the world, sometimes mistakenly limited to just good and bad, uh, uh, but um, the whole idea underlying the symbol is that the life of the spiritual aspirant is a process of learning to keep those two things in balance. And um, that, as was just described, um, and, and, and uh, as characteristics of, of the uh, the philosophy represented by the Kabbalah shows another um, connection uh, between those two systems. Um, in in uh, each of the <clears throat> magazines, the Fraternal Review magazines, we you feature a book. This this issue we featured two books. <clears throat> the first one pictured here is the Kabbalistic Tarot. It's both a textbook and a source book for the symbols of the Western Hermetic Kabbalah. Written by the co-creator of one of the Golden Dawn tarot decks, it's the first major, the first and only work based on all four of the major tarot decks in most common use today. Those are the Golden Dawn tarot, the Thoth tarot, the Rider Waite Smith tarot, and the traditional Marseille tarot deck. So this wonderful book for every card has an, an illustration of that card in each of those four decks. And they each have their own special kind of uh, slant on, on their meanings and significances. And um, all three of those four, all except the Marseille deck, were invented by um, by Masons, and of course, each one of those Masons was also a member of the Golden Dawn. Um, Freemasonry, 
just to draw this point a little fi more finely, Freemasonry is intrinsically an initiatory order, like many of the ancient wisdom schools. But whereas they intended to have higher and lower degrees, inner and outer ceremonies, we as Mason take the same three craft degrees. And this was part of the introduction that I read to you before, so I'm not going to go through that again. Um, the uh, next book that we recommended is called The Fool's Pilgrimage. And this book is written by uh, the Gnostic bishop, Freemason, and Jung scholar Stefan A. Heller, who um, is, he's the bishop of the Ecclesia Gnostica, and they meet uh, near here over in the uh, Los Feliz area on uh, Beechwood Drive at the Annie Besant, uh, uh, which was an and the about a hundred years ago was 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 an active Masonic lodge. Anyway, his book focuses on the way in which the 22 major arcana of the tarot serve as symbols for a certain method of meditation, the objective which is similar to what Jung, Jung calls individuation, by which he means the lifelong work of self-realization. And um, the Research Lodge sells signed, copy, signed copies of this book. The um, the idea of the lifelong work of self-realization is again, to me, very um, evocative of the whole idea of, of the uh, Ashlers, uh, which represents the, the career work of, of Masons. And now I want to <clears throat> highlight one other thing that was in the magazine that gives a, a, an example of the Masonic symbolism and the potential that that has in the uh, in the book we're all familiar in, in the tarot I'm sorry we're all familiar these all maces are familiar with the four uh, cardinal virtues of Freemasonry which are temperance fortitude prudence and justice and um, I'll say a few words about that. Having their origin in Plato's Republic, the four cardinal virtues were not known as such until their inclusion in the Christian tradition by St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, and others around the late 300s. Sometime after the mid 18th century, lectures pertaining to the cardinal virtues became a regular part of Masonic ritual. Gebelin, about who we heard a little while ago, being an active Freemason in the latter part of the 18th century, these lectures and thus the cardinal virtues would have naturally been quite familiar to him. It is therefore a concept that would doubtless have been fresh in Gebelin's mind at the time he encountered the deck. The cards wherein he saw an indication of the cardinal virtues were those labeled temperance, force, strength and energy and suggestive of fortitude and justice. However, to his dismay, he could not find a card entitled prudence. On the other hand, <clears throat> one thing did jump out at him as being odd. The figure of the hanged man seen on the right hand side up here um, was erroneously, he believed, inverted. If the hanging man was to be turned right side up Gebelin reasoned the impression given would be of a man, hands hidden behind his back, standing on one foot. For Gebelin, such an image, with its subtle indication of graceful poise and wise reserve, was perfectly fitted to represent the missing value. A few year, short years after the publication of his book, a professional fortune teller calling himself Italia also a dedicated Freemason, issued a volume titled How to Entertain Yourself with a Deck of Cards Called the Tarot. In it, while claiming to have invented the art of cardomancy, which is fortune telling with cards, some 30 years prior to the publication of Gebelin's book, 
Etila, God knows how this is pronounced in French, so, but it's E-T-T-E-I-L-L-A. Uh, offered for the first time a means by which the tarot might be employed for divinatory purposes. Whether or not he was being truthful in his claims as the father of cartomancy, his bo uh, Gebelin's book obviously made an impression on him. Following Gebelin's lead, Atelier not only showcased the president's presence of the cardinal virtues in the tarot by reordering the trumps and placing the cards in question together in chronological order, he even went so far to as, as to invent the figure of the hanged man card before renaming it Prudence. And that is invert, I'm sorry. Um, he also changed the title of the force card to fortitude. From that moment on, the four cardinal virtues would forever be cemented as an integral part of the Tarot's composition. Freemasonry has made its spark. However, that's not the end of that tale. as I'll explain as we look at this uh, sequence. Um, Eliphas Levy, who I read you a little biography of just a while ago, um, was something of a purist when it came to the tarot, and he was not content to reorder the trumps or invert cards the way Attila and Gebelin had done before him. He therefore returned to the original names and arrangement of the tarot of Marseille. Additionally, Levy saw in the original version of the Hanged Man card something that both Gevelin and Attila had previously missed, an allusion to the doctrine of the world's savior. Reluctant to attribute the virtue of prudence to the Hanged Man card, Levy returned the figure to his original upside-down hanging position and began to search anew for a card that might represent the value of prudence. Let's see, we already talked about fortitude, which is the strength card. Um, that search ended when he settled on the hermit. Prudence is defined in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as the ability to govern and discipline oneself by the use of reason. How fitting then to choose the hermit? a figure cloaked with reserve and supported by discipline, whose path is illuminated by a singular lamp of reason. Yet the hermit, for all practical purposes, is a perfect fit for the virtue of prudence. Our fourth cardinal virtue within tarot had been found. Since the publication of Levy's book, the analysis has been virtually uniform. From weight to worth, almost every commentator followed Levy has adopted the reading of the hermit card as prudence and has seen in temperance, strength, hermit, and justice cards allusion to Freemasonry's four cardinal virtues, temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. It is now the universally accepted reading among the vast majority of tarot enthusiasts. Gebelin, Etelia, and and Levy's Masonic hunches have now become tarot law, so to speak, and the influence of Freemason will, Freemasonry will forever be felt in the strange and fascinating world of the tarot. For anything else at this point, it just wouldn't seem prudent. And there is our justice card filling out those four virtues. And that is it.